Okay, let's go back to the attack. Jumping into the enemy trenches. Oh my god, it's hell. Oh, and how come the German sniper can see them? Every shot is a hit. <laughs> oh, finally. Yes, I'm so happy. But at least someone read the book and was like, let's input the grenades. Hi and welcome to History Legends. In this video, we'll do a step-by-step -step historical breakdown of a Latvian war movie called Blizzards of Souls. And honestly, I'm very excited because this movie was heavily inspired by the story of a World War I Latvian veteran called Alexander Grins. You know it, it's gonna be epic. Are you ready? Fresh cut, check. Sorry guys, today, no turtleneck. Let's, oh, hold on. A thousand thanks to all my patrons for sponsoring this video. You guys are truly the best. All right, so the Germans have bombarded the Latvian trenches and they're a bit shocked. Okay, check this out. So first of all, we can see the very famous World War I Russian Furashka, the peak cap with the national cockade in the front. Usually the Imperial Rosette would be black and orange. But since these men are Latvian, they have their own emblem, this one. Honestly, I couldn't find its name or its significance for Latvia, but it's this grayish one. And the fact that they're wearing coats is also on point. Their uniforms are very accurate. Al dente. Okay, what's going on? It seems they're bleeding from the shock. Come on, oh, guys, what is this? No way. I call BS. Blood coming out of your ears is symptomatic from a serious injury due to concussion or severe blow to your head. But it isn't the case here. Maybe they just added it for a dramatic effect. Because honestly, the shell didn't even fall right next to them, it fell further away. But the fact that it's buzzing, that, that's pretty good. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go back a second. What did we just see? Okay, I'm not an explosive expert, but this doesn't seem like the result of an artillery shell. Also, we only see a couple shells being fired. Only in that specific sector. In my opinion, it's the result of a Minenwerfer, or a German trench mortar. During World War I, the Germans loved the Minenwerfer. It was a short-range artillery that was able to reach across the nomad's land and quickly fire at any target that would present itself. So I guess this is what happened. They saw one of the Latvian soldiers and fired a couple mortar rounds immediately. Okay. So I think this is their first time in combat and they're pretty shocked to see the blown off arm. So the old commander is his father. <laughs> oh. The old commander is actually an interesting character. In the movie, he's a sergeant major. So for the Imperial Russian Army, that was a non-commissioned officer just above a sergeant. Now, the reason he's in command of this group of men is that he was a veteran of the Imperial Russian Army for 15 years, more specifically in the Kusholm Regiment. And that's all they say in the movie. But this regiment is actually a very special unit because it was part of the prestigious Imperial Guard of the Russian army, of course. Now, in my opinion, he looks about 60 years old. That means he could have even fought in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878. However, if he's younger, he might have never seen combat because the regiment did not fight in any battles from the Russo-Turkish War up until World War I. Honestly, the uniforms and the trench, very well done. What? If we don't respond, they will start firing much harder? <laughs> what? I swear, it might be a coincidence, but there is a very similar scene in a World War I French movie called A Very Long Engagement. And the reason I remember is because in both cases, it's so unrealistic. Why would you want to leave the protection of your trench if enemy artillery has already zeroed you in? And also, don't forget, this guy is a sergeant major. Maybe in command of a squad. Like, they're not gonna do this attack only with a squad. <laughs> it's a bit ridiculous. But it's always in. Oh, quick pause. Check out this weapon. This is a Mosin Agent, model 1891, 
Jagoon, is widely used in the movie. Despite the fact that during World War I, Latvian riflemen were not equipped with the Dragoon variant. Latvians, just like any other Russian soldier, used the simple model 1891 Mosin The regular model, let's say. I'm being picky, it's a little detail, but honestly, it's not a big deal. But what I wanted to say before is that I find it very interesting to see a World War I movie from the Russian perspective. It's pretty rare, especially nowadays. Yeah, it's foggy. Interesting. Oh yeah, so this is the main actor of the movie. And he looks like late teenager, early 20s. Honestly, I like it. Because Alexander Grins, the one that inspired the story, was also 20 years old in 1915. But if you look at his picture, it's interesting that although he was 20 years old, in my opinion, he looks much older. But that's a recurrent theme for older generations. Like, he doesn't have the same baby face as the actor here. Okay, they don't see anything. We can see some barbed wire, but it's very spread out. Oh, someone fired. Probably misfired. Oh, stand in a single line? What is this order? So they're all lined up outside the trench as a big target. Okay, this goes against Every survival rule of World War One. Okay, how many are there? I see about 15 soldiers at most. We're gonna launch an attack with 15 guys. Seems more like a raid, but massively under strength. The reason I say this is because in 1915, the Latvians managed to recruit a battalion-sized unit for the Russian army. Now, a Russian battalion was separated in four companies, and each company had about 150 men. Now, what I think happened is that they actually took inspiration from an actual battle, the first major battle of the Latvian riflemen, which took place on the 29th of October 1915, which involved a company-sized unit on the command of a man called Briers. So what happened, like in many war movies, they probably scaled down the battle from a company-sized unit to squad. If this can work in certain scenarios for World War I, it's highly underwhelming. But let's see. So we can see them moving into a swamp. So with the fog, could be early morning. But that's actually very realistic. Because the landscape we can see here is actually very close to where the actual battle took place. Hold on, actually, I'll just show you. So according to my research, it took place south of Riga. Because in fall 1915, the Germans launched an offensive from Jelgava to Riga. And this is where the Latvians faced the Germans at Plakantiems, right on the banks of the Misa River. Now, I don't know exactly where the battle took place, but we can guesstimate. We can see that nowadays there's a bridge here. I believe German trenches were about in this area because the Germans had a footbridge across the river and probably positioned their trenches around here. And I believe the Latvians attacked from here. And if we use street view, this is what the German position looks like today. And the Latvians would have attacked from in front of us. And what I believe is that back in the days, the area was surrounded by swamps and forests, just like in the movie. Now, the only change they made, probably for practical reasons, is that the Latvians did not advance under the cover of fog, or rather because of a thin layered snow blizzard. So yeah, I know a thing or two about snow blizzards, and I can tell you this is exactly how it looks like, with more wind. You can't see 5 meters in front of you. So it's easy, just like the young guy here, to get lost from the main group. Now the, the Russians like to attack in such weather conditions because the Germans couldn't use their massive firepower, machine guns, artillery on the Russians when they attacked. The Germans were blinded. So this was the advantage the Russians had. And the Russians love to attack in difficult terrain features, forest, swamps, and now you add a layer of fog. So let's get back to the historical battle. The Latvian attack on October 29th was based on surprise. And hold on, I take back what I said. It was actually 60 men that were involved. So not a full company like I believed. 
So what happened is that the Latvian riflemen sneaked up to the German positions. The Germans had no clue that the Russians were that close. And the Russians loved to troll the Germans by attacking in these inhospitable places. And there's a similar story in my veterans book. One of the stories in it is strangely similar to what we see in the movie. It's the perspective of a German soldier fighting on the Eastern Front in 1915. He fought more in Poland. I'll read it out to you. Here's what he had to say. During the night of September 30 to October 1st, we worked hard to dig in our positions. Suddenly, around 2.30 a.m., shots were fired to the left of our company. Furious battle cries. Russian officers pushing their men to charge, yelling, Hurrah! As we later learned, cavalry patrols reported the existing swamp as inaccessible. For this reason, the commander of that section did not occupy this inaccessible swamp. But the Russians, who were well oriented in their own country and have a certain skill in force fighting, broke through the swamps. What I like about both the story and the one in the movie is that it changes the perspective of what we think of the Russian army during World War I. It wasn't just massive assaults in open terrain with no tactics involved. The Russians were well aware of their lack of firepower and compensated their lack of artillery by attacking the Germans in difficult terrains. Oh. Wait. How could a German see anything through this? Oh. I'm not the greatest weapons expert. But I read online that Arthur here shows modern military trigger discipline, which was not in practice during World War I. I can't tell you more about it, but let me know in the comment section if you do. Okay, an enemy. Okay, he's charging. Not very aggressive, but... <laughs> okay, it's, it's not an enemy. Oh, hold on. Why is our character here not wearing the beloved Plash Palatka? You know, this iconic rolled up cover that the Russians had over their left shoulder. That's it. The movie is so inaccurate. <laughs> just kidding. I was just waiting for that specific moment to be able to lecture you about it. Because honestly, who apart from you and I actually care and want to know more about this stuff? <laughs> now, the movie is not inaccurate. At the beginning of the movie, we clearly see the Latvian riflemen wear the Plash Palatka, probably because it was mostly worn in summer. But what is the Plash Palatka? Actually, it was not a rolled up cover, but more like a poncho slash cloak tent. It's the iconic Russian gear. As you know, it was even worn during World War II. It was some sort of universal gear, suitable for a variety of situations and useless for most. <laughs> Official use of the Plash Palatka traces back 1882. Back then, it was strictly used as an individual tent. However, in 1910, the tent was modernized and soldiers starting to wear it to protect against rain when they were out on the march. In theory, it's perfect. The problem is, it doesn't even reach your knees in the front. And heavy rainfall will soak your feet. And worst is, the cloth was very thin, so it wasn't even fully waterproof. A soldier would have become soaked after two hours wearing this. And overall, it provided surprisingly with very little benefits. I guess the Russians were like, meh, it's better than nothing. Now, the reason why we don't see our Latvian riflemen here wear it is because having a coat and the Plash Palatka on your shoulder makes it a bit tight to move around. So it was only worn when out on the march. And also, since they were in a trench, the Plash Palatka was not really needed. All this to say that the movie did a good job. It's accurate. End of lecture. Thank you for your patience. Let's go. Okay, he finally found his buddies. Okay, we can clearly hear the German sniper. Any surprise effect they had is gone. Why even attack? Oh my god, this is so BS! <laughs> no way! Oh, come on. They can't see 5 meters in the fog, but you tell me that the German soldier can. I might know why. The German sniper probably used the UAV perk, 3 kills. That's right if I remember correctly. And then he saw them moving on the map and just fired blindly in the general direction of the Latvians. That's the only explanation I can find. The fog is clearing. Okay, time to attack. Why are they so slow? But anyway, I still feel it's a bit weird how they're so slow to move through this area, like not stealthy at all, fully standing, so slow. They're not even ducking. And how come the German sniper can see them? Every shot is a hit. 
<laughs> oh, finally! Yes, I'm so happy! Okay, this is so accurate. Yes! Okay, the reason I'm happy is because this is exactly what happened during the historical battle. I mean, this battle was inspired, loosely inspired by what happened. But at least someone read the book and was like, let's input the grenades. Just like I told you, the Latvian riflemen sneaked up to the German positions. In my opinion, they were crawling or sneaking up by ducking from tree to tree. Each rifleman before the attack was handed four hand grenades. So that fact alone tells us that this attack was planned. It wasn't just in the rush of the moment. Now, once they were close enough to German positions, they all threw their grenades one after the other. Can you imagine the effect on enemy lines? 60 men throwing four grenades each. 240 grenades in a trench. I wish we could have seen this in the movie. That would have been epic. But no, we always have to focus on the silly bayonet charge. Anyway, after the grenades exploded, the Latvians jumped the German trenches. Honestly, the German defenders had no chance. So the person that wrote the script did well, but the execution is a bit meh. Oh, oh my god. Here we can see a mortally wounded German soldier next to an MG. More precisely, a Maxim NG-08 on a Dreyfus 16 tripod. If I'm not mistaken, it was the most common German machine gun during World War I. And this shot is actually very close to what would have actually happened. The Germans indeed had four machine guns defending their trenches near the Misa River. And just like we can see here, they were taken out most likely by the grenades that preceded the assault. Okay, let's go back to the attack. Jumping into the enemy trenches! Oh my god, it's hell. Oh! Okay, I'm sorry to ruin this combat scene. But check this out. Sometimes in movies, I notice how they're lacking details, but sometimes they add details that shouldn't be there. <laughs> because can you see this huge 16 on the German helmet? That would indicate that the Germans here are part of the 16th Infantry Regiment. However, that regiment only fought on the Western Front. So it's a nice touch that they added a number on the German helmet, but it's not accurate. Out of all the units that fought on the Eastern Front, I don't understand why they put number 16 on the helmets. And the worst thing is that we know someone very famous in history that could have worn a similar helmet because he fought in the 16th Bavarian Regiment. In reality, the Latin Rifleman faced the 2nd Battalion of the 376th Infantry Regiment of the German Army, which was formerly known as... Get ready. Ersatz Infantry Regiment Nummer 2 Königsberg. That means we should either see 376 on the helmet or nothing at all. Why do they have to make things up when we know the actual information? So now we have a typical trench warfare scene. Everybody killing each other. Bayonet. They're not even using their bullets anymore. It's pure butcher. Very gore. Oh, come on. What the hell is this? <laughs> it's actually so bad. <laughs> Honestly, this is where this battle scene just takes a wrong turn for me. It's literally a copy of the trench battle scene in All Quiet on the Western Front. Especially the part where they hit with the shovels and all. The only difference is that in this movie, the soldiers are so slow and it's more gory. Let's be honest, such situations were extremely rare. Humans have this instinct of not wanting to be shish kebab by a bayonet. So what do they do? That's right, they run away. And this is exactly what happened during the actual battle. That day the German soldiers got confused by the grenade attack and the follow-up assault. And they all ran back towards the footbridge across the river. And this is where they suffered most of their casualties. Not only were they getting fired at in the back by the Latvians, but also by Russian artillery that concentrated on the footbridge. Again, this shows that this was a carefully planned operation. In the end, the Germans lost 31 dead, 45 wounded, and 34 of them were taken prisoner. The German company holding that bridgehead was effectively annihilated. Meanwhile, our Latvian riflemen lost six dead in the battle, as well as eight wounded, of which two would die in the hospital. 
Okay, it's so messy. They want to make it realistic, but by being so messy, it's actually just so unrealistic. Okay, typical scared young guys. Oh my god, are they choking each other in the back? <laughs> Why do you bring weapons if it's to end up choking each other? But there are much more problems in this scene. First of all, the trench is too wide to start with. Compare the trench we see in the movie with the one in actual picture from the 376 regiment on the Eastern Front. You can see it's much more narrow in reality. Why? Because it protects from artillery shells. But here there's so much space, it doesn't protect against any explosive. And the reason why they did the trench so wide was for scenes like that. Look, the guy can swing around his rifle with bayonet left and right. In a tight environment like trenches, it would have not been possible. This is why bayonet massacre in the trenches, highly unlikely. There's no space. Trench clearing was mainly done with man equipped, simply with a pistol and hand grenades. Much more efficient. So now we have the scared young soldiers stereotype. Boom. And of course, the bayonet has to be stuck in the guy. Okay, I just spared you all the gore. This reinforces the idea that men don't want to suffer from that, a bayonet wound. So they either run away, and if they can't, they surrender. Oh, surprise, surprise, this is what actually happened. And now, after the, the huge battle, the soldiers are simply chilling in the enemy trench. We don't know how much time separated the, the battle from this moment, but... Probably not too long, this body's still there. And, uh, yeah. So the Latvians are victorious. Although in a normal situation, this would be highly unlikely because the Germans were notorious for counterattacks. However, since we know that the actual battle was against a bridgehead and the footbridge was destroyed, the Germans have no way to counterattack and they can actually chill. And overall, capturing this bridgehead was important for the Latvians and overall the Russian army because the Germans wanted to use it as a staging ground for the attack on Riga. So that's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. And once again, a thousand thanks to my patrons for sponsoring this video.